Hello all, a very good afternoon. Myself, Professor Mohil. Full name is M. L. Shankar Karmogilan. I am an assistant professor of law at the National Law University, Odisha, Katak. I am here to present to you all the American and Scandinavian legal realism as part of advanced jurisprudence course for the purposes of e-classroom project of Uni University Grants Commission. Now, to begin with, let's ask a simple question. What is law and legal theory? And in that context, where exactly do we place American and Scandinavian legal realism? Of course, there are sub-questions as to whether these legal realism realists have contributed to the development of legal theory or not, and whether or not legal realism amounts to a legal theory. But at this juncture, to begin with, simply ask a question, what is a law? We have had the legal formalists very categorically pointing out law is nothing but logic. Logic to the extent that it's to the complete precision. If you give us a given set of facts and if you apply the given set of law or legal rules, it will give a simple, clear, definite conclusion, either in the negative or in the positive. But then is it so? That is one of the questions legal realists are trying to or attempting to answer. Now, along with this, maybe also we need to consider the point of time in which legal realism originated. That is, later 1980s, 1800s, or especially 1890s. And at that point of time, we all have to appreciate, especially in this United States of America, where common law system is being followed, primarily the law, common law is as such judge-made law, relying more on the doctrine of precedent. And whatever the decisions given by the court in the past will be having a binding effect on the judges in future, on the courts in future. Given that context, and the doctrine of precedent and its importance, significance, in common law countries, we should be able to appreciate as to why the legal realists could have felt that realism is to be clearly explained or they need to look into what formalists have said is fine or not fine. Now, if you look at the long history of common law along with that point of time, relatively speaking, you have a number of courts being increased, number of judges are being increased, and so on, the number of cases decided also being increased. Net result is some deviations to the extent required, if not possible, is to be felt or was felt when the judges decided a number of cases during the course of time. When such changes were noticed, some people were very quick to point out these changes are not having any logic behind that, or deviations are not having any logic behind it. And why do they feel so? Because they felt, unlike formalists, law is not just devoid of or judge neutral. Because formalists felt that the role of judge is very limited, simply to apply the law to the given set of facts and to tell what is the conclusion. And formalists never felt the role of judge as such may have any influence on the legal outcome. But whereas the realists are always of the opinion that once you think of law as a mechanism or what law is, it is not necessarily just logic but it is an experience of individuals. So hence, it differs from person to person. The law, when it is applied to given set of facts, may not yield a very clear result as contemplated by the formalists, especially if you think law to be without having any influence by policy and such other aspects and irrespective of who the judge is, the legal realists 
pointed out that is probably not the case and why so to begin with realism simply means or is an area of study relating to the cognitive bias involved in decision making and legal realism specifically means the cognitive biases that could be found in the judges that influences the legal outcomes now according to legal realists what is nature of law law primarily depends on the persona of judges it is definitely not logic but necessarily experience especially in the famous words of uh, oliver wendell holmes and they also pointed out a number of factors to have an inherent influence which are not necessarily having any logical explanation the factors like that of socialization of the judges upbringing their ideology which they subscribe to personal preferences and to the extent some even pointed out the idiosyncrasies of judges may might as well influence the legal outcomes on the other hand if you look at what the law really is according to formalists it is definitely not having any scope for differential interpretation at least not to the extent of judges directly performing a role they are there merely to interpret law they cannot make the law law cannot mean what the judge thinks it is rather the judge is there simply to expound or explain or interpret what the law is which was either in the statute or in delegated legislation so on and so forth so basically when you look at american legal realism in the context it is a conflict between aspiration and reality in the sense aspiration by aspiration i mean what law is according to formalists and reality that is at the ground level the law is not to be seen what is to be taught as in the textbooks or in the legal documents that is the difference between the aspirations and the reality and of course when we look at the legal realism aspects for instance oliver wendell holmes has pointed out that but for the personal experiences and their explanations law will have no meaning as such because mere words as to be found in the legal document is not having much import rather it is the judge who brings life to those words hence it is i mean it is because the judge who brings the life to the words hence the meaning of the word largely depends upon who the judge is what his personal experiences are and so on and so forth now there is a number of possibilities when we talk of what the law is for a legal positivist the law is as it is whereas for a natural law jurisprudence perspective from a natural law jurisprudence perspective law has inherent norm law as ought to be but if you look at the legal realism perspectives there are jurists who have pointed out legal realism is nothing but a subset of positivism in the sense that legal realists necessarily decide or analyze the law as it is like any other positivist although with a critical outlook but nonetheless the question they address is what the law is but not what the law ought to be unlike natural uh, law jurisprudence schools now if you also think what the legal realism has been termed as other group of scholars have also team termed the legal realism as predictive legal theory what it necessarily does is whether or not the law can be predicted or the legal outcome precisely to be can be predicted and especially not from the perspective of a scholar or from the perspective of a judge but from the perspective of an individual who is the citizen of a country whose parliament or the legislature by whatever name it may be called makes the law so from the perspective of the citizen whether or not the law is predictable the legal realists are of the opinion it is not predictable why is they think so because the judges influence the outcome a lot their personal experiences so on and so forth influences the legal outcome the 
formalists approach of law being certain determinate etc does not according to legal realists apply hence the legal outcomes are not certain since they are trying to predict or they focus on predictability of law the various other scholars have pointed out or termed legal realism as predictive legal theory also now to further move on on the question of legal realism and its subsets legal realism is further divided into rule skepticism and fact skepticism what is meant by rule skepticism it basically refers to the nature of the law to be as to be found in the legal documents being indeterminate it's not so concrete so definite it has multiple meaning possible and the judges depending upon their mood maybe at a given point of time pick up whichever possible meaning they want to pick up because inherently the words as used in the legal documents have scope for multiple appreciations by the individual in other words whichever word is to be found as part of a legal document it does not have a single meaning ascribed to it rather the meaning of the word as used in the documents depends on who sees those words or a particular word depending upon the nature of the individual the personality of an individual that is who ultimately is the judge the words acquired their colors does not have a single ascribed possible meaning on the other hand fact skepticism means the facts are appreciated by different people differently it necessarily has an approach that is even if the law is determinate assuming that it is determinate still the facts are such it cannot be appreciated by everybody in the same way let us see this fact skepticism with a simple example suppose a lorry with the load of about 8 tons of uh, steel is traveling on a national highway and you have a driver you have a cleaner of course the context in which we discuss is what is fact skepticism i hope that is clear now the lorry with about 8 tons of uh, steel one driver and a cleaner in other words a helper they are going say at a speed of about 60 kilometers per hour because it is a national highway and you have a law which clearly says if any lorry driver or a lorry loaded or otherwise causes either grievous hurt or causes life of an individual who is a road commuter or a traveler that person will be or shall be punished with the punishment of say life imprisonment not a capital punishment though but life imprisonment now imagine a situation when this lorry along with the driver and a cleaner is being drove uh, on the national highway suppose suddenly a cyclist is trying to intervene and the lorry driver out of abundant caution applies the brake please note this the lorry driver out of abundant caution applies the brake by accident he has kept the leg not on the brake but on the accelerator of course when you keep your leg on the accelerator you won't expect the lorry to stop do you you don't whereas instead of getting stopped the lorry is getting uh, moving faster now the driver screams why is it that the lorry is not stopping only what's wrong with this brake system now please note his state of mind over here he applied the brake or at least he believed it to be so and he expects the lorry to stop as early as possible and he also expresses very clearly when he notices that the lorry does not stop that why it is happening in spite of his actual intention to stop the lorry now who is the person who is very close by to the lorry driver who probably can observe all this the cleaner 
Now, as such, in a fraction of second, everything has concluded. The lorry driver had hit the cyclist, of course, who just intervened for a brief while. Now, the lorry cleaner and the lorry driver are in for a shock because they have hit someone and they knew that there is a law that is going to definitely be of a consequence. Now imagine out of fear the cleaner or the helper boy runs from that place or the helper man ran out of the place. The moment he runs out of the place, who is the person who is having better proximity to see or take control of the situation? Passers by, obviously. Few motorists, maybe two wheeler drive riders or some other lorry drivers or bus drivers and passers by, some other passengers of any other vehicle, so on and so forth. But please note one thing, if this matter goes to a court of law, I repeat, if this matter goes to the court of law, imagine an onlooker giving a testimony. What testimony will he give? There will be a simple question, did the lorry driver apply the brake on time? The lorry driver would plead he did and he intended as well and he did not have any intention to accelerate the lorry and thereby cause the death of a cyclist or grievous heart of the cyclist. But please again remember what will be the onlookers testimony? They would simply say, no, no, we saw the lorry driver was actually accelerating so much like previously he was coming at 60 kilometers per hour approx. Now we could clearly observe or I could clearly observe that the lorry driver increased the speed of the lorry which forcefully hit the cyclist and the cyclist lost his life. Please note, had the cleaner is available or had the police been able to locate the cleaner, it is quite possible for the cleaner to tell actually what happened in the, inside the lorry. Whereas for an onlooker, they have not heard the driver speaking any specific word or a sentence. When they observed from outside, they believe that the lorry driver did accelerate the lorry and he did hurt grievously the cyclist. Now that the cyclist is no more, even if he is alive, he will not be able to testify what happened inside the lorry. No other onlooker either except the cleaner. Now that he is afraid and he absconded because he afraid for his life and safety and so on and so forth, how the courts will decide the matter? Obviously, they would conclude that the lorry driver did accelerate the lorry. If this particular fact is not going to play a role whether or not the lorry driver grievously hurt the cyclist or killed the cyclist, it will definitely play a role when it comes to the decision on the question of sentencing. Now, fact skepticists specifically point out to this sort of situations where appreciation of facts are very, very difficult, number one. Number two, it again depends on individuals and their experience. Now, the similar example or same example as that of the lorry driving can be looked at from another perspective also. Now, imagine if the lorry driver did not apply or press the accelerator, but he accelerated only the brake only. But now we have new generation vehicles which are partly auto controlled. Fine. Now, suppose the software which was programmed for working this brake system properly became a failure. It gave a wrong signal. Instead of controlling the brake, it mistook it or there was a virus which read that as acceleration. Now, obviously, the appreciation of this fact that this is what exactly happened in that given lorry when it was moving on the national highway has to be testified not by a simple onlooker, but you may require an expert opinion. Now, definitely a court which has access to an expert opinion compared to an ex court which does not have a access to expert opinion will be definitely deciding things 
differently, if not deciding the case differently, definitely they will appreciate the facts in a different way, in different light, all right. Now, if you appreciate these fundamental differences, that is how law in itself is being understood, law by itself being understood differently by different people and the scope and meaning of law differing or varying depending upon the individual who looks at it and also the facts being appreciated differently by different people, you would be able to appreciate the realists are trying to point out the shortcomings of formalism, whereby they point out law is nothing but what the judge says it to be so. And will that lead to legitimate law, fair and justice to people involved in this entire question? It largely depends upon the persona of the judge. This is according to the realists. When so far when we have discussed realists, this group of realists may be termed as American legal realists. As against this group of American legal realists, we do have another group of legal realists who are known as Scandinavian legal realists, who think the law as it is to be found does not only get explained by physical facts, but there are many psychological effects whereby the citizens behave in a manner they behave. If they see that outcomes will be different, they will behave differently. And how do they see what sort of an outcome that can be had in a given circumstance? That largely depends upon not just physical facts, but a lot of psychological effects according to the Scandinavian legal realists. And if you talk of Scandinavian legal realists, you will be able to specifically look into the approach taken by Scandinavian legal realists and as well as American, American legal realists are converging as to the shortcomings of legal formalism or positivism. But they differ in the context of the functioning of law or the interpretation of law. That is, legal American legal realists point out that the judges play a significant role. As against this approach, Scandinavian legal realists point out that there are factors other than physical facts which are necessarily the psychological factors that determine the behavior or it which influences the behavior of the citizens. Now, what are the criticisms against legal realism? Inherently, there have been number of scholars who have pointed out that the legal realism's arguments lack merit because for those scholars, law to be found in the books, to be found in such other legal documents, statutes, as it is there, you cannot question that to be not being determinate. So they fundamentally they see there is a lack of merit in the realists arguments. And particularly when the realists pointed out that law does not have determinants, it is indeterminate. HLA Hart came up with a very important criticism or explanation that law is not indeterminate, but it is having need for being open textured. Meaning that the law or the words used in a statute or in any other rules etc. must be of sufficiently flexible nature to appreciate different sets of facts and whatever changes or differences that could be found in a given set of facts could be addressable. To that extent, HLA Hart pointed out that the law is not indeterminate, but it is open textured and the open textured nature of the law is for a purpose. 
it is not without a purpose but it is for a purpose although the legal realists wouldn't agree this with this and they would point out that it law is rather indeterminate uncertain the legal outcome is not predictable now just as a wrap up if you appreciate so far the context in which legal realism originated in the united states of america it of course got into the peak of its scholarship in 1920s and 30s now it is 2014 around 100 years down the line we are discussing this topic and also in a different country altogether that is also a common law country but still none of the factors that perhaps we could find at the time of origin of legal realism may be necessarily present in india as it was present then but still the next question for us is how do we contextualize legal realism in india in present times let us take the conflicting opinions given by various courts especially various high courts the provision to be interpreted is same every word every full stop every comma is same but still the court in chennai reaches one con- to a one conclusion while the court in kolkata or in mumbai reaches a different conclusion how do we explain that if we apply the legal formalists point of view that the law is capable of precision clarity predictability the outcome must be one and the same in whichever court the matter was taken up so there is a problem because it is a fact that there are in number of subjects number of conflicting opinions while the provision that was interpreted remains to be the same how do we explain that so there seems to be some merit when legal realists argue that it is the judge who happens to say what the law is because there isn't any other law as it is which can simply lead to same conclusion at least the conflicting opinions tell us in that direction take us in that direction or compel us to think in that direction on the other hand you look at the role of judiciary as we have been taught montesquieu's separation of powers doctrine the classical separation of powers doctrine we all know legislature is there to legislate or enact while the executive is there to implement the laws and if there is any dispute it is the duty and role of the judiciary to decide but are we there to conclude the judges simply decide the cases and interpret the law or do they make laws legal realists think it is the judge who makes the law because but for the judge's conclusion the pay words to be found in statutes and other legal documents is of no consequence and in case of india which way we may appreciate is it the judges who make the law or do they simply interpret the law and in this context i'd like to draw your attention to the long standing debate we have had and we still have on judicial activism by the higher courts of india especially the supreme court where in the apex court in number of cases right from keshavan the bharti versus union of india where in the court held basic structure doctrine to be the bedrock of indian constitution thereby a number of provisions in the or articles in the constitution is said to be not changeable because it will violate the basic structure of the constitution to godavarman tirumal pad versus state of kerala again an environmental law case and so on and so forth so many other cases are also there for want of time we may not find out every single case but you take these few cases as a case study wherein you will be able to conclude that in number of circumstances 
the supreme court has been criticized of judicial overstepping that is that the supreme court did not stop by interpreting the law but they actually made law another case an ample example could be visakha versus state of rajasthan although merits and demerits of judicial activism has been debated at length our purpose right now is not to debate the merit and demerits of merits and demerits of judicial activism but to appreciate the relevance of legal realism in india in view of or in light of judicial activism debates now think of it how do we really appreciate do the supreme court stops by interpreting the law or has it actually enacted the law do we see whatever perspectives realists advanced some 90 100 years 90 or 100 years ago to be present relevant in today's context in our country i feel it is to be 50 50 by which i mean that the points raised by legal realists is definitely of consequence if it had not amounted to a separate legal theory as legal realism's approach may not amount to legal theory proper but nonetheless it definitely helped us to appreciate the legal theory in general in a much better way and those of the factors that are not documented by formalists but nonetheless having an impact on law and its implementation and practice of law is being attended to just because of the contributions made by legal realists in that sense we may now try to analyze what is the relevance of legal realisms in case of india's judicial activism i am of the opinion that the judicial activism at times have overstepped at times have filled in the void which was not attended to by the legislature but can we conclude that it leads to law per se lacking any meaning and law as such to be what the judges said it to be i disagree to that point because but for law as being enacted by various legislatures that is state legislatures and the parliament the judges wouldn't have the platform to interpret or to act on so therefore it is not completely true when the legal realists say that law is just what the judge says it to be although the judges do play a role and the factors that were pointed out by legal realists are true to a very great extent but that does not mean the law to be found in the statute books does not have any meaning or they lack meaning except when the judges try to say what it means independent of what the judges say what it means in my opinion the law has to be found in the statute book does have a meaning let us take a simple example if you look at day to day life our lives individual lives you take how many times we think what is to be done what is not to be done when decision is to be made by every individual in one or other way they definitely take into consideration the law as to be applicable simply because there is a scope for some amount of doubt as to what will be the outcome together we cannot keep the law completely aside only when we appreciate that in day to day life also we apply the laws without the help of the judges for that matter without the need to take any help from the judges law does serve a purpose to that extent law definitely law definitely has meaning 
in its own right and it does help the judges to appreciate and to decide the cases and to conclude this discussion especially approach article from the perspective of article 141 of the constitution wherein the supreme court is expected to do complete justice and correlate that article with the realism's perspectives what do i mean by that i simply ask you guys to think further and appreciate in view of the complete justice to be mandate of complete justice to be done by the supreme court that the apex court or the highest court of the country should we conclude that the judges do make law or that the appreciation of complete justice to be done by the supreme court is still within the scope of the constitution without really taking away the meaning of law as it is to be found in the statute book or in the constitution whichever area in which the court is required to decide a matter i am of the opinion notwithstanding the complete justice to be done by the supreme court still the law has its own meaning although the perspectives raised by or the points raised by legal realists remains to be valid that is there is a great amount of influence by factors other than logic those influences alone do not make what the law is they only fine tune what the law is and to a very limited extent i hope from here you will be able to read on further the subsequent materials are being identified in the links provided in appropriate pages and as well as the specific uh, reading materials also are being uh, provided where you can read on the points that we have discussed at this juncture let me quickly tell you guys by this time or after listening to this lecture on what all points you should have an idea and you should have clarity one this can also be termed as the learning outcomes of this lecture number one you should know legal realism as a school of legal theory as part of advanced jurisprudence paper you should be able to appreciate what is the meaning of legal realism and that legal realism is of two kinds namely american legal realism and scandinavian legal realism meaning and scope of american legal realism as well as meaning and scope of scandinavian legal realism what are the commonalities what are the differences between american legal realism and scandinavian legal realism major thinkers and scholars who have been the exponents of american legal realism and scandinavian legal realism and fact skepticism rule skepticism are in the right order to put it in the right order rule skepticism and the fact skepticism how it affects what the law is and also the fact that irrespective of the fact that legal realists happen to be criticizing of formalism still legal realism is to having been appreciated as one subset of positivism and it is also known as predictive legal theory and its relevance to mother india especially at the present context and also you should be able to appreciate whether our judges decide the cases just by interpreting the law or they actually make laws thank you so much